Hi, and welcome to Inspirational Leadership. My name is Kristen Harcourt. I'm an executive and leadership coach, speaker and consultant, and I'm super passionate about humanizing the workplace and transforming leaders. The reason why I, I created this show is so that we can have talks with uh, progressive CEOs, HR leaders, experts who are really past, passionate about creating positive work cultures. So I am super excited for today's guest. I have Heather Younger. Heather is the founder and CEO of Customer Fanatics. So awesome to see you today, Heather. Yes, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So Heather, tell me a little bit more around what you do at Customer Fanatics. Um, we help, the main focus is for, um, for us to help organizations and their people, their employees find their truth. And we find, help them find their truth through um, employee engagement survey, uh, aggregation of the data. We help them with employee focus groups and culture teams. We really just help them do something about what they're hearing. And then we also do leadership training and workshops and executive coaching. And in all of those places, we are helping them seek the truth for them individually or for them as an organization. Mm, so such important work. So we're, we're here to talk about inspirational leadership. So I would love to hear from you, Heather. How would you define inspirational leadership? Hmm. I kind of, when I think about inspirational anything, I think it's, doing more than just motivating. I think it's helping people see the seeds of greatness inside of them um, and, and then help that, that then seed that's planted and, and what you do with it, having, having them use that seed to actually drive forward some positive change within, within them um, and or their organizations. Yeah. So, I mean, Heather, to get you to where you are now, I mean, you didn't just start your company overnight. You've had your whole career journey. So talk to me a little bit around what got you to where you are now and why you're so passionate about this work. Well, what, what practically got me here is I was uh, a victim of a layoff. <laughs> so there was a layoff that happened probably, um, gosh, I want to say five years ago. Yeah. And in before the layoff happened, though, there was um, a merger, there were a merger of five companies, and there, the trust went downhill in this merger process. And it was in different states, and no one really knew who was who, and people started seeing titles that sounded like their titles. And so they would, people started to come to me at the, the company I was at here in Colorado and ask, like, what's going on? This is, I, no one's telling us anything. And so they just became really fearful. And the trust went downhill. And I, at one point, I went to the head of HR and I said, "Listen, we have got to do something about our engagement and the trust that's here." And she said, "You know, you're right. You should go do something about that." I went, "Huh?" Yeah. I was I was leading customer experience at the time, yeah. and I thought that was weird that the person in HR was really like you do it. But part of it was I was already the culture bear there. I was already one who lifted people up. I would see the greatness in the people who were on my team or not. I always just wanted to bring people together. And so I did that. I went and created this council. And to start, it was kind of strange bringing people together. But, but then um, after a while, I started to see huge difference in the, sh in the trust that was happening, the shift that was happening. And it was really exciting to see it is because we were forcing people to kind of get to know each other, to see each other as humans, as coworkers, kind of on the same journey of lot, not knowing a lot. Um, and so that's where the change happened. But unfortunately, the layoff it was kind of inevitable because they had hired some really high powered people and it just wasn't um, the product wasn't basically producing results enough in order for that uh, those people to stay. So they end up just starting to lay people off. And I was one of them. It's probably 150 people to start and they laid off more. Wow. And uh, I while it was an owie at the time, it hurt because I was a sole breadwinner of a family of six at that point. Um, it was it was really the the catalyst I needed to just say you need to get off the mark like you, you, this is this is what you're supposed to be doing you're supposed to be the voice for employees for people who don't normally have a seat at the table who are sitting and waiting for things to happen around them they're trying to wait and see what their leaders are going to do um, and so you need to be the voice back to the executive leadership team to say listen this this is what your people want this is what they need and if you want more out of them and you want more success in your business you have to listen to them more effectively. So that's where I'm at today. It's why I got why I got here from a tactical or practical, I guess, perspective. Yes. Um, and then, of course, you can. I have a TED talk that talks a little bit about my backstory of the backstory that says why are you actually doing this work, right? Yes, yes. And let everyone know what's the name of your TED talk. Um, it's transforming adversity into opportunity. 
Mm, excellent. And I think you and I both agree that sometimes things don't happen to you, they happen for you and wouldn't get to this path you're on now. Well, we say that when you're in the messiness and the scariness of it, you're not thinking like, yay, <laughs> this is exactly. This is exactly what's supposed to be happening. Um, but uh, yeah, it takes yeah not, not doing that so much. Right, right. And then it takes some, some courage and, and bravery to really step into what you're really feeling called to do. Um, and, and Heather, you and I both share this passion around what we're not calling soft skills anymore. I, I call them the human skills. Um, people call them a lot of different skills, but they're those, what I believe are the fundamental skills that are so needed in leadership in order to, to create these positive work cultures. So, so why do you think the human skills are so important? Huh. Wow. It's weird because I almost don't even know how to be without those skills. Um, I'm not, I don't have a very high IQ. I'm not, I'm average uh, on the IQ side. I'm, I'm definitely above average on the EQ side, which is kind of what we're talking about here, the emotional intelligence stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm not perfect. Yes. Okay. And so I'm a work in progress. Yeah. I think that these are important because we can't experience true human connection. We can't get the, uh, we can't make people feel cared for, truly listened to or respected as humans on this planet if we don't possess those skills. Yeah. And <laughs> the more astute we are with listening very proactively, engaging very deeply, the more effective we're going to be as a leader, just period. Um, that's why people would come to me. I don't do a lot of things well. I can't do spreadsheets well. Don't, be, don't ask me about a VLOOKUP. Like, I, there's a lot of things I just cannot do well. I'm not a highly organized person. I need to be a highly organized person. Um, but People would come to me and still do uh, about inner interpersonal skills, things that, you know, how do you communicate with this person? How do I communicate this thing? How do I do this thing with this person in this space? And I think that's what, like us as coaches, we as coaches, we actually focus on that. Like, how do we help these people that in these leadership roles that have the positive power to change the lives of those they lead? How do we actually help them to be able to be more effective and get more out of the people and get more for people so they can actually grow and flourish as well? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would, I'd love to expand on, on where you just went there because you and I are both also um, firm believers on uh, a huge impact that can happen when you're working with one-on-one -on -one with a coach. And, and I believe through coaching, it can help an individual to really truly understand who they are at the core until you spend that time really understanding who you are and develop that self-awareness. You can't really serve the people around you as powerfully. So there's a couple of things I'd ask, like to ask you. I still notice, um, you know, some organizations, there's some progressiveness and they're really understanding the value and having support for leaders. But unfortunately, there's a lot of organizations that are still not there yet. So why do you think um, working with a coach is so effective for leaders? I, I think there are a few reasons. One of them is uh, we help them think way outside the box, right? Oftentimes, and that includes us, like we all need our own coaches. Yeah. And so, because again, we're not perfect. It helps us think outside the current line of, of frame that we are living in right then. And so that's the same thing that happens with our clients is that we help them to really think outside the space they would normally would go and go, oh, wait a second, I really didn't think about that. Yeah. We also, as ex executive coaches, help to hold them accountable. Like they know we're going to ask them, how did that thing go yeah. that we talked about last time that yeah. you were going to be doing? Yeah. And when they don't, they go, oops, you know, and so they feel kind of weird about not actually meeting that goal. And so you know, having the accountability, I think is, is clear there. And I do think kind of what you said too is, and we help them go deeper. We, we help them understand the importance of the human connection of the, of their, their true effectiveness, how they can be more effective yeah. if they really focus on those human skills as you described them. Yeah. So I think there's, there's multiple ways. I, I, I have one, I just, I remember I'm thinking of one client now that I, I, I told her something just for me, it seemed really intuitive and super basic, but for her, it really helped to reframe her thought process about how she interacted with people. And, um, and, and I was like the superstar, but in the end, I'm like, no, it's really, in the end, you're the star because I gave you the input and I gave you a different way to think. And you used that to be thinking differently now when you're interacting with people. Um, 
so I know I loved I love to think of us as coaches as really like kind of like when you think about on the basketball court, like we help you become the star. Yeah. Um, right. Yes, it's such because a great Kobe analogy. Bryant and all those people, they, yes. they look good because the coaches have really done well with them. It's not just all their natural gifts and their, yes, they do have those natural gifts. They do work really hard on themselves. They're self-driven, yeah. but that coach really does help to polish, um, polish off the jaggedness of, of how they might be and really just make them a stronger leader. So. Yeah. And I, I use that analogy all the time with sports and coaches. And if you look at high performing athletes, they always have a coach for that reason, because they go to heights, they wouldn't have gone on their own. They have somebody who's also championing them. And, and sometimes we have limitations. And then the coach is like, yeah, I, I you think here, I see you there. Uh, and I love what you just talked about there too, Heather, which I, I think is really important to acknowledge is it's the same reason why us as coaches, we all work with a coach because we can have our own blinders on, right? When you're kind of in the trenches and doing your thing, sometimes it's like you're seeing things like this. You don't have this more expansive view, but when you have somebody else and then you also have the space, a lot of times we don't even give ourselves the space because we're such a go, go, go society that when you can step <laughs> back, so true right? We don't have the time, but then we step back and then the coach is saying something. And then all of a sudden, like you just said, they're receiving. It's like, Oh, I never thought of it that way, but they wouldn't have gotten it. It's just somebody else reflecting that back for them. And all of us, if we can, when you're so in it, you can't sometimes see things that when somebody else can, can be that guide for you, they can help you see things. And again, that expansion, which is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. What do you think around organizations that are still not getting it? Why, why do you think some companies are not supporting their leaders in this way? Because of course you and I, it's like a no brainer. <laughs> Where do you think the gap is that some organizations are still not recognizing the, the value or even the importance? I think some of it, depending on the size of the company is a budgetary thing. And right. so it depends on the size of the company we're, we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I don't, executive coaching is not the main thing I lead with. It's not my main service line as it is more with yours. Uh, it is more ancillary to the work that I do on the voice of the employee space that just pops up and becomes obvious that leaders need help and they come to me for that, right? Yeah. Um, it, but I notice that like it's the companies that are, you know, mid to large that are going to want to invest. It is because it is an investment. It's an investment. And with any investment, you, you're looking for a return. And, and you find the return pretty immediately, particularly like I think the work that I do in the executive cooking space is more around, it's, it's less around like, how do you get organized? Um, there is some, there's some definitely some time management stuff in there, but more often than not mine is, is about the human skills. So uh, I'm helping them feel, how do you relate more to those that are right at your level? Or how do you relate more to those above you? Or how do you relate more to your people that are reporting to you? Um, and so what are those ways that we can help you become more relatable, connect more, right? Um, at a deeper level, listen better. Um, but, and so that you end up seeing the fruits of that by the productivity of that team, by the, so the projects that are coming out, uh, if it's a sales organization, what are the sales looking like? Yeah. So I think there are definite ways. And I think the, the best way to do that is to set up kind of, um, those mile marker check-ins and say, what does success look like from this? And so I think the organizations that might be on the should maybe think of, I think we need to offer this, but let's set up some of those guideposts and say, okay, when they, we'll see if it's successful by this, this, and this, yeah. you know, and I, they do that everywhere else, but sometimes they don't do it in this space. And that's why they don't end up seeing some yeah. of the fruits of that, of that labor. Yeah. So, um, but it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. You're right. I think it's when that you can show at the end, look at where, th where we are three months in, six months in, 12 months in, like look at the before and after so that you can see those. And then also be setting those really tangible goals so you can see this is what success looks like so that you can be looking for those new behaviors. Mm -hmm. So when you think about leadership, what are the qualities that you think are really important in, in terms of being a, a I, I'm just going to say successful leader, but I also, with, from my perspective, inspirational leadership is also the best leaders create more leaders. So what do you think those qualities are that, that um, effective leaders bring to the table? I think because I'm looking from the emotional intelligence side and the ability to connect, I would say the first one would be to show them that you care, to show your people that you care. Yeah. And that sounds really elusive, but it's not hard to do. And an example might be, um, uh, you have an employee who's struggling, they're struggling in their current role and you could easily just ignore them or you could write them up and write a performance improvement plan up, which is not a bad thing always, 
uh, but you could just do that and kind of move them out of the organization. Or you can choose to sit with them and kind of be serve as their coach and ask them what might be going on with them in and out of work and what their challenges might be and how you can remove them. And are you serving as the barrier and, and let them be open and honest about doing that, about giving you that feedback. Uh, so I think caring is probably the foundation of all of it because you could, because there's so many things that come from that. For example, if you care for your people, you want them to feel important. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be, you're going to greet them when you come in, you're going to greet them when you leave, you're going to, um, when, when is there something going on in their family, you're going to make sure you check in on them. You may even like make a visit to their home. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you might do. If you care for them, you're also going to be looking to grow them. And so you don't want them to be, you're not happy that they're in the same place they were in five years ago. If you care for them, you want them to move out of that. And so you want to help them grow. And like you were talking about, uh, Kristen, you want to see if you can promote them and can they move on to other roles, whatever that is. If they, if you think they should, if they're an amazing musician and they're doing something in accounting and accounting is great, but it's, you know, they would really like to be doing this as a day job. So then how can you as their leader actually help them with that? Yeah. So caring, there's just so many practical uh, ways that we can help them and, and show them that we care by doing some of these things. Um, so I, I do believe I have a podcast called leadership with heart. I do believe that leading with heart produces amazing ROI as, mm -hmm. as well. So um, the things that I'm talking about may say, sound kind of squishy and mushy, uh, but in the end, I guarantee you they get results. The people that worked for me, that reported uh, to me, that were on my team, um, I felt like I worked for them equally because I was always their cheerleader trying to just raise them up all the time. Yeah. Uh, but I got, there was, we achieved some great things together and they would do anything for me even today when I'm not working mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not that I'm like just so brilliant and I'm just so perfect. And it's not, not actually many times I, I admitted my mistakes to them and I had to go to them and apologize for poor behavior. Um, but I think that's the, the issue. That's it. That's it. And there's that human side that Kristen talks about, the human experience, the human yeah. skills that we really focus on. And that's what makes effective leadership. Yes. It's so huge, right? And you, it, it just, you wonder why people still don't get this. But uh, to be able to show <laughs> up, uh, people are so loyal to leaders who genuinely care about them. Uh, and then another thing that you brought up, which I think is so important as well, is uh, humility and transparency. And because guess what? We are all human. And you mentioned this right at the beginning as well. We're all works in progress. We're never done till we're done <laughs> uh, learning because it's, it's, it is an evolution and we continue to grow in one area and then it might be, okay, this is the next place and keep going, going, and going. Um, but when, when you come from that place, and I love that it's called leadership with hearts. Um, and, and I think sometimes people feel like, especially when I talk to some of my linear thinkers or the engineers, or they're like, oh, this heart stuff, it means, and I'm like, it's not at the absence of, of course we need the head, it's the head and the heart, but bring in yes. the heart too. Like we, yes. a lot of things where the, the head is an amazing thing and we need to be able to, to, to use it to think about things and analyze and all of that kind of stuff. But when you bring the heart into it, everything gets, just gets done so much so much, so much better. And I think the other thing that happens with these workplaces that are so busy and people are to the brink and it feels like there's not enough time in the day, it feels counterintuitive to do this human stuff. Cause it's like, I got stuff to do, but yeah. counterintuitive, but by being proactive, you actually end up being more effective at getting everything done because you're having this connection with the people around you. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. I do. I, I agree with that. I think that uh, when we when we think of human, remembering that human is good and the bad and everything in between, and we have to actually show up with our people in the place of imperfection. Um, we hear this a lot, you know, Brene Brown, a lot of these people. They talk about vulnerability and uh, shame and all these things that we bring up and that that that, hap that exists at home and in the workplace. And uh, I think this idea of making sure that we or show our people the full of us, like all of us. And it doesn't mean we're going into saying, oh, I'm going through divorce and, I, and just like totally like a victim, you know, like just crazy with it. But I do think people need to know, I remember before I came into one role, there was a manager who preceded me and I, the people would say, you know, like I didn't even know that the five years he was there, he had gone through a divorce and remarriage and I, we never knew about it. And I think that is a shame. Mm -hmm. I think that's, quite a shame. You know, people need to know who you are. 
And that's the good, bad, and in between. It just is. Yeah. And the more you can come to, to, the, to the reality of that, that as humans, we have to share all of ourselves and we have to also receive all of our people in their humanness. Uh, you're going to be just less uh, disappointed and, and feel more fulfilled as a leader, for sure. Yeah, you know, Heather, that reminds me of a story. I remember I had a client, um, you know, in more of a, a financial leader. So same thing. He felt like he needed to have that armor to the point that he had a, a baby and a lot of people, like a new child and a lot of people at the workplace had no idea. And I remember when I challenged him to get a photograph of his daughter and bring it into the office and have that picture. To me, it would it'd feel like, I, I remember I'd always have offices that were covered in pictures, but for some people, that was actually a big step. That was a big moment of vulnerability for him. Uh, and I was so proud when he did it because of course, now you've got this picture of your daughter on your, um, in your office. It creates immediately this connection, right? You're letting people in. Oh, you have this daughter. I didn't even know you had a daughter. And then it starts to make them feel more comfortable to share parts of themselves that previously they were also having that armor, armor for. So um, so I love that example. I think that um, the more we can just let people in and, and remember that we are full people, that we are humans, that we do make mistakes, and that being a human, um, I like to talk about this when we say people leaders, where they go from individual contributor and then they become people leaders and they say, oh, it's so messy. Well, because they're humans, right? We're, we're, we're very multifaceted. There's messiness that comes with it. <laughs> yes. Embrace the mess. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Embrace the mess. Um, Heather, I'm curious if, if you think about, you know, a leader that really had a big impact on you, um, maybe a story of a time where they showed up as a leader and it really impacted you. Uh, it could be from, you know, a leader in the workplace. It could be a leader outside of that. It could be a mentor. Uh, but I love to give people those examples of those stories, leadership in action. Yeah, I have one that's it was just amazing. Um, so I had a, a boss who uh, happened to be kind of an equivalent of a COO of a, of a large county. And he had this way about him anyway, but he, he, he was a leader. He could be tough. He could say, yeah, yeah, you're not going that direction. Like, we're not going there. Like, he was that kind of guy. But he also was the kind of guy that would, would just immediately, intuitively know, like, something wasn't quite right. And so one day, he came down to my office, and I, I had had a lot high level of frustration because I felt like, they were hired me to do one thing and there were just a lot of barriers and a lot of obstacles and people, I didn't even know if I'd be able to get any of it done. And so he came down and he, he kind of it, unexpectedly unplanned. Uh, this is a 2000 person organization. And he just came to my office and, and he had a grin on his face and he said, Heather, listen, I know you're frustrated. I know that, uh, you know, we, we might, you may feel like, and we may be the senior leadership team might actually be stopping you from doing what you hired you to do. But, I hired you to do exactly what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. So I want you to keep your chin up and do it because we know that you're doing what you do best. And he had like a grin on my, a really big grin on his face. And he said, okay. And I said, yeah. And I don't know, at that point, just him coming down and doing that, I felt literally like I wanted to hug him right then, to be honest. I didn't, I actually held back. I didn't hug him, but I really wanted to reach over to the desk and just like give a big fat hug. Yeah. And I just, again, I just felt like he met me where I was at. Uh, he showed me that he cared, but he stepped a step, step outside of his daily routine to just say, I gotta, I'm going to go down and talk to Heather. I'm not going to yeah. have a you know, grin on my face. I'm not, I'm not going to make an appointment. And, you know, if sometimes when that happens, you're like, oh, boy, what did I do when you're coming down <laughs> to your office or up to your office, right? But this time it was, it was, it was some really good news. And uh, so he made a huge impression on me. And he kind of just had that way about him the rest of my time with him. And, and actually, he actually left his position because he felt like his values weren't aligned with the values of the person he was reporting to. And so he decided to make that decision. And that's exactly who he was. He was very a, a values-oriented leader. Yeah. And I'm connected to people like that. Like, I feel a connection to people who are values-based. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's my story. And, and mm -hmm. to this day, he has a, a, a big impact. In fact, uh, probably it was like in the last three months, I don't know, it was about three months ago, his, um, I don't know what happened, but his, his son who was in his 20s just passed away in his sleep unexpectedly. Aww. And all of the emotions I had for him, because I haven't seen him in like two years, three years, yeah. maybe four, I mean, it's been a while, like three years now. Yeah. And all those emotions, all those feelings of the way he took care of me, made me feel taken care of when I was there going through some, like a tough time in the workplace. Yeah. And so I said, I want to go to him. 
like I go, I'm going to be there. I even need to do doesn't want me there. Just expect me there. You know, I'm going to be there. And, and right. I remember the exact moment when he looked right at me and we kind of lo locked eyes of He was with his wife. Of course, everybody was very teary eyed. It was, it was a funeral. Yeah. But I remember him lo locking eyes at me and he just goes, mm -hmm. like, he just kind of gave me this, like, Oh yeah. You know, I just, I'm so happy to see that face, you know? And so that was awesome. Cause I could do the same, what he did for me when he came down to that, the office that day and he had that grin. And his face yeah. was Okay, Every, I can deal with everything else that's here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what a beautiful story, Heather, because I think that sometimes people don't realize it's not the grandiose, it's not the big things, it's those small moments that all add up. And what a beautiful example of connection, right? I was just getting goosebumps the whole time, right? That's what uh, connection looks like. It's amazing. The, the true connection that he and I had was just, and, and just to see that and to know, okay, I'm here, like, I'm, I'm here. Like, I know I'm only a small little... Peg and all these other people are here and they're probably more important as far as like family and things. Right. But that exact moment, it made me realize that, yeah. that, um, that we, that connection from years ago and what he did for me now, I could actually give it back to him. Yeah. So. Oh, beautiful. So Heather, the last question I'd like to leave you with, if you're thinking about, you know, um, all of the work that you do and going forward to organizations, um, what do you long for for companies? If you could, if they could say, okay, this is what I'm going to do to try to create a more positive culture. What kind of advice would you give to them? And I know it's multifaceted, but sometimes we have to start somewhere. What advice would you give? Yeah, and I always believe that the number one thing organizations can do is to listen more effectively to their people. And so that's listening in one-on-one -on -one meetings that most managers never have. That's listening um, in performance review sessions and in, in advance on paper in person. That's listening via employee engagement surveys um, where, we, where we're looking at reviewing the comments where it's listening in focus groups and or culture teams. So it's just listening in multiple ways in a really clear and connected way and then doing something about what you hear. And that's what I would say. Those two things really drive so many other things. Like I said, I end up doing executive coaching because the organization listened well to the tail and all the data and it said we need to work on our leaders and then they hire me and other people like not just me but there's other people right and they hire teams of executive coaches to come in and help because they listened and they acted and so that's and, and the other thing is to communicate back what it is you hear and what often happens when we're listening is because i do think it's the most important thing that an organization can do um, is that we listen we act and we never connect the dots back for the people who gave their voices forward. So then their voices, even though they may see some things changing, they don't put the, they don't connect the dots. They don't put two and two together to say, what I said that day in that survey, in that comment, or in that focus group, or on that one-on-one, -on -one, or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, it actually had impact. My voice is powerful. Yes. I can change things. Yes. I'm not just a victim to leadership, right? Yeah. So that's what I think is the most important. And that is my hope for organizations is they listen more effectively. Mm. I love that so much, Heather, because you are, you're helping those individuals feel empowered. And that when they see that their, their voice is listened to, they're more likely to continue to speak up. And we need people to continue to speak up because we can't just have people up here that know everything because you don't know everything that's going in the organization. It's all throughout and in the trenches. And um, I, I share what you said there. Yes, yes, listening, and then take action and talk about the action. Because I, I can't tell you how many times where they did the first step, but then, which is great, but then they didn't do the second second step well, and actually messed up what they did with the first step because not only did they not take action, they didn't communicate anything, and then the people are like, okay, the next time they ask, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be honest again because it's an exercise. And then nothing's really happening with this. So I'm not, I'm not bought in. So true. So very true. It's a very frustrating thing for, <laughs> for practitioners like myself. Like I'm in it and I'm, I, that's like my main focus and it's so frustrating. And I try to partner with organizations that are um, a little bit more, you know, attuned to that and know that that's part of the process. So I try to explain what that process is and, and what it's going to look like a lot. Also then know that whatever you're, doing, whether it's with executive coach or in or any organizational development stuff you're doing, that's not a one and done scenario. That in order to keep a culture strong, in order to increase engagement and keep it there, in order to retain your best people, you have to have a system and a process in place. And it needs to stay that way. It needs to be a well-oiled machine. You cannot get rid of it. So what happens, and I know you know this, 
what we do ends up being a nice to have when the industry, when the market goes down or when, you know, the money is, is tight, but it really needs to be the thing we hold on to. Yeah. It's the thing that will continue to differentiate the organizations because they're people in those downtimes, the people will be the ones that are the yeah. biggest cheerleader for, for bringing in new talent, uh, for doing the work that needs to get done in the tough times, even if you have to have a pay cut, like there's all kinds of things that go around this. Um, yeah. But if you show that you care, foundationally you do that, yeah. you can, you'll keep your best people. Totally. That's a beautiful way to end this off. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here today. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I feel real blessed to be here. Thank you.